welcome back um, to our final round, Developers Having Coffee With. It's a pleasure to have Nicholas Hornout here from Airbnb. Um, Nicholas is a software, currently working as a software engineer at Airbnb, to which I will come back later. But first, um, I'm more interested in your like teenage years uh, <laughs> because uh, you're 23, right? Yeah, that's correct. And on, on, on LinkedIn, I read that 10 years ago, you reverse engineered more or less um, the iOS ecosystem. Which some people also refer to as jailbreaking, which, if you do the math, uh, would, you were 13 at the time. Uh, it's, it's it started getting into that. Like most of the stuff happened like a few years after, but uh, okay. it I started getting into that scene around that age. Yes. How how did you get into that scene? How did you get into this community? Um, I've always had a fascination with like. I think bulletin boards, like from a very young age, you know, I would start like going on the internet, reading stuff up, stuff like that. And eventually like, you know, that magical day came when Steve Jobs like presented the iPhone in 2007. And so um, I just wanted to have one of these devices. Like I thought they were really cool, you know? Um, and I'm pretty sure like it changed the life of all of us somehow. So um, at one point I was luckily able to get my hands on one of them. And I discovered I couldn't use it in Austria. And uh, I was really disappointed, you know. I, I, I had this thing that was kind of like only available in the U.S. It was like region locked or like carrier locked. And so um, eventually, I was like, you know, there must be a way around that. And like I did my usual like kind of research that I would do as like I had to forums and chat rooms and just kind of like figure it out. And there were like people doing this thing called jailbreaking. It's only like emerged a few, like a few months before. So. Um, Eventually, I got into the scene, and uh, you know, they needed kind of developers, and uh, I'm not very sure how I uh, how I eventually got into the developing scene. But they were like, "Hey, we're in need of this tool," and I was like, "Well, I sort of have some programming experience, so um, let's just see how far I can get." And that just kind of like kind of escalated and escalated and escalated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I mean, just to clarify things here, I mean, jailbreaking, hacking, you know, mm -hmm. these terms. Were those activities at any point like technically illegal? Not really, right? Not necessarily because uh, we always made sure that like everything was in a done in a proper way. Like I think the only way that would really make it illegal is if you were to ship code that was copyrighted by Apple. So it was mm -hmm. like if you ship Apple software outside of their distribution channels, mm -hmm. then that would be considered, you know, uh, illegal and they could, you know, like go like take legal courses on you. Um, what we always did is we provided tools that interacted with them, and they were 100% like written by ourselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I mean, jailbreaking, it, there was a lot of demand because mm -hmm. a lot of the, the first iPhone just shipped with no third party apps, there was no hotspots available. So there was a lot of functionality that people wanted to have, and I think this was a big driver for jailbreaking the iPhone and getting access to the actual operating system, right? Yeah. I mean, that. I think that was the driver. Uh, absolutely. I think, especially at first, I think the p potential wasn't there. But like, given that the iOS like was always like promoted as having the same operating system as macOS, a lot of the Mac developers of the like mid two thousands were really eager to get their uh, applications uh, up and running as well. But then when Steve Jobs announced that you know HTML was uh, HTML five was supposed to be mm -hmm. apps. Everyone was kind of left disappointed, you know, and so they turned to jailbreaking because that was the opportunity to kind of like try out their ideas, and eventually Apple realized that and followed up with an SDK. Yeah, yeah. And I think at the beginning it was like kind of like a, a nerdy thing to do, but I think uh, it was later on it was quite accessible, so uh, it was not so hard to, to, to jailbreak your iPhone uh, in the later versions. Definitely. I mean, it started out because there was a lot of mainstream demand, mm -hmm. right? But like, and initially the tools were very hacky. They were like, they involved like this famous method of like a 70 step tutorial. Um, and eventually we realized that, you know, there's so much mainstream demand because the iPhone had such a slow rollout. I think mm -hmm. over four years it took to like have it like be available in most markets globally. And uh, I'm not sure if they have to this day succeeded with everyone. Um, so. There was a lot of mainstream demand because, like, people from all over the world just wanted to use it in their countries, and they couldn't. So the only step to do it was to go through the 70-step tutorial. So eventually, I think we realized that you know usability was something really important, 
and um, to this day, I think that was like one of our key mottos. It's like make it as easy as possible, but also as secure as possible. And I mean, Apple rolled out um, versions after versions, so um, and also added features like added third-party apps, added the hotspot, um, added notifications and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, is there any? point in time where you could really see a decline in the demand of jailbreaking the iPhone? I think that must have been around like 2013, 2014. Okay. Um, that was that time where, you know, I think iOS 7 came out. Like there was still some demand and a lot of it was like granted and like a lot of features though, like they were, they were, they were copied and like they were actually implemented in an official way and it's something that wasn't like really hacky, but kind of like, you know, like was done properly by Apple. Maybe they're like not as, as good, but like they went most of the way there. And they did it in a way, you know, that made sense to their interface guidelines and everything else. And I think that was the most important part. Um, is uh, eventually I think everyone was so satisfied with how iOS worked that the need just kind of like went down yeah. and it went and it just kind of like further continued because eventually you know everything that you wanted to do kind of already got done you know like okay. initially the iPhone didn't have video recording so we added that uh, even though it was really really slow. And then kind of Apple added that functionality. So like you lost another kind of like bunch of users that just Get came for the video game. for the for the that just came for the video functionality. Yeah. So then there was the portable hotspot, right? And then once Apple added that, you lose another bunch of users that just came for that. Yeah. And so on and so forth. Cool. So and afterwards, um, to continue, um, you landed your first Internship uh, at Airbnb. Mm -hmm, that's correct. How how did this came about? Like, how did you get this internship? Um, it's fairly common practice for um, tech companies and startups to kind of like reach out to people. And so I had a few friends of mine join that st uh, startup back then. Um, and you know, like uh, recruiters go through LinkedIn pages and everything. Uh, and I just got an email one time, and I was like, okay. Um, Let's, let's have a phone call, let's see where this goes. And uh, I just felt really good about it. It was a company that, you know, like both in engineering culture and culture in general, um, as well as all of its values, I just, um, I just agree with. Okay, cool. So you did uh, two internships at Airbnb uh, before you started full time. That's true. So the internships, uh, were they also iOS related? Uh, the internships were, um, once I switched full time, I switched towards back end development and kind of like back and front end. So it's like, I see myself a bit of a full stack guy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And was this, uh, your choice? Did you want to go into back end or how did, how did it happen? Yeah. I mean, you know, I feel like doing the same thing over and over again started like, it's something that also I don't find as interesting as much. Mm -hmm. Like I do like to venture out, like I think the next thing is for me to get really big in front end and just see, you know, see what it's like there. Um, so back end for me just seemed, seemed appropriate. Mm -hmm. You know, I started doing some sort of back end stuff at the end of my second internship and I was just like, okay, I like the, I like the feel of that. So I was like, you know, let's, let's just keep going. Okay. And when you started as a full-time employee uh, at the Airbnb um, and from what you know, Today, mm -hmm. uh, what is what is uh, defining Airbnb's culture? How do they how do they hire? What are they looking for in people, uh, in skills, uh, skill sets, but also beside the skills, soft skills? How does it work? Um, I think everyone like we have we have our sets of like. First off, I think one of the most important things is like diversity standards, and we have a blog post about that that you know you can read up on. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, I think we just want to have like a, a good environment. You know, we want to have good people around. I can't like say too much about that because there's like a lot of internal stuff, and like that's not really my expertise. Mm -hmm. But uh, we just want to have a, have it be a fun and like good environment to be around in. I think that's like sums it up, and yeah. I, I really enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, I remember it. I, I had the pleasure to meet you once at the offices in San Francisco, and I have to say it was really impressive. Um, how well designed the office was, but also how welcoming it was. And what was especially outstanding was there were a lot of pictures from people. And uh, this was actually customers or hosts from Airbnb and all these big, big pictures with the stories of each individual. And what I also liked especially was uh, all the meeting rooms. They are actually modeled after Airbnb room, um, rooms that you can rent. So it's a very 
uh, yeah, diverse working place as well. So uh, Absolutely. really impressed. Uh, one of our core values um, is being a host. And you know, yeah. if we don't start from the inside, then I think you know, like it shouldn't like it's not a core value, right? And I think that's why I lo I, I really like this place so much. Yeah. Um, so talking a little bit about San Francisco, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you were pretty young when you moved there. Mm -hmm. uh, what what was the biggest difference for you, like uh, leaving Austria, going to San Francisco? How was the what was there a culture shock or? Um, it was like I think for my first internship, it was like the first time I was ever in America or something. Uh, it was definitely a culture shock, like a lot of like nostalgia. Like maybe you've seen it from like old video games or something. Mm -hmm. Like you you never met or like movies. What do you imagine San Francisco to be like? But then it never is. Um, no, everyone's just super friendly. Uh, I think I really enjoy that. That you know you can walk up to everyone. You can kind of like have a small conversation, even mm -hmm. even if it, you know it's kind of like meaningless. Like it's that meaningless small talk that I think uh, they perfected it. Um, but it's it's like eventually it blossoms into a conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's a meaningful conversation. And I've always been like a, a huge fan of that. Okay, so in general, you like San Francisco. I like, like San Francisco. It's, it's it's a great city. Um, yeah. Of course, you know, no place is perfect, but uh, that's the great part about it because you can kind of like contribute your part, mm -hmm. and you can help out with volunteering and like a lot of like helpful causes that yeah. you know improve it. Any recommendations if like somebody wants to go to Silicon Valley mm -hmm. uh, and just explore? Um, I think go out of the comfort zone. Yeah. San Francisco is something that is not just like Market Street and Fisherman's Wharf, but it's um, it's most it's like a lot of diversity. It's like you know every block is kind of different. Like you go uh, into the mission and you have a lot of Spanish influence and Mexican influence. Then you go up to North Beach, you have the Italian influence the American Italians like you go to hate Ashbury and you have like something that's like you know the hippies from the 60s and 70s and like just this explore around like go to every like small shop that you can get like stay away from like I think the big chains and everything and 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 go local I think San Francisco is is such a such a diverse area especially like for example, fruit and like vegetables, like you can they, you can like go up an hour north and you'll see where they like are grown and you can visit the farms and everything else. I'm like I was really interested in that. The wine farms in Napa are super mm -hmm. nice, and you can have like uh, the best kind of outdoors, just like about an hour or two yeah. out. Yeah. And in general, I think also you meet a lot of tech people there yeah. because it really feels like. Everybody's there. Everything is happening there. It's kind of like you know how finance is in New York and how en uh, entertainment is in Los Angeles. Mm. It's kind of like you know technology is in San Francisco. Chances are, if uh, you go into a bar and you talk to people, or you go like you're in a you're in a cab together in Uber or whatever, um, like they'll likely work at a startup, right? Yeah. Like they'll likely have some experience. Uh, it's kind of like you go you know you go to LA, you talk to someone, they're likely you know talent acquisition, like movie, fee like movie, like agency or whatever, you know, and, and that same thing like happens here and like in New York, obviously it's like finance and law and stuff like that. So it's the Mecca and it's good for like making connections and networking. So do you have any questions for Niklas? Hey. I got like two questions. Uh, first question is uh, if you see the iPhone X right now hmm? and you g have the opportunities to jailbreak it, what would you change about it? That's a really tough question because uh, to be honest, I haven't actually used the iPhone X that much. That's the first one. Uh, I still use an iPhone 8, uh, and the second thing is I don't think I would change anything right now. I'm really happy with my phone the way I have it. I think uh, Apple has done a great job um, and is continuing to do so. I think you know sometimes their changes, you know, they take a time to like acclimate, but like overall, like it's pretty solid. It's a pretty solid operating system. Okay. Nice. And last question is, what's actually the meaning behind Airbnb? Uh, Airbnb comes from the longer name that it was formerly known at back in 2008 and 7, and that's called Air Bed and Breakfast. Oh. And so Bed and Breakfast short is B&B, and that's, uh, they just kind of stuck with that name. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Hi. 
Uh, are you involved in uh, technical interviewing and how do they usually go? Um, I have some experience with that, yeah. And like technical interviews, that highly depends on the company and I can't go too much into depth on that, but I can give you like a generalized explanation of how they go. And like they're usually, you know, it's algorithms, it's about, you know, technical understanding. So there's a lot of resources, like one of the, I think, most famous books about it is like Mastering the Coding Interview. Like, go through that and you kind of like get an understanding of how those interviews work, you know? Like, they're fairly common practice within, within each company. And they're like, sometimes tricky depending on the company, some of them trickier, some of them are not. Um, but usually they all work around the same kind of thing. You get like a logical puzzle or like a, a coding puzzle and you kind of have to figure it out in like a, a short amount of time or like 45 minutes usually. Um, it's definitely something that I think you need to like have a lot of practice in before you do it. Like uh, I fell on my nose a couple of times too. Um, and I'm like, I'm not really the biggest fan of it, but it's like still kind of like industry practice and there's hard to find like a better solution for that as far as I'm aware. Any more questions? No? Okay. So, Nicholas, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. pleasure. Thanks. <laughs>